Lord, as our, as our king and our friend, you will never lead us astray because you are good, God. You are so good. Thank you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I had a few people ask me about the lamp last week. Thankfully, the lamp did not make it to my house, but it apparently has found a good home that somebody absolutely loves that lamp. So thank you, Jesus, that somebody else found a place for that lamp besides my house. So it has it is well, well homed. So anyway, thanks, Tim. Um, expectations. Expectations. Um, you know, we have expectations for behavior. We have expectations for uh, a lot of different things. Um, when I was just, when we were just starting out in ministry at our, um, at our first church that we served, um, I remember um, some people kind of commenting about our kids' behavior. It wasn't Joel. Joel was just a baby, so it wasn't him. Um, but, you know, we, we, you know how I feel about kids running in church? And, and I'm okay with kids running in church as long as they're not hurting anybody or hurting anything. If they're having fun and having a good time, you know, it's okay. And so, I, you know, I kind of had a little bit of a different philosophy of, of, of children's behavior. And I went to a church that was um, a little more traditional, a little more reserved. And um, had somebody, you know, say, you know, pastor's kids, pastor's kids shouldn't act like that. And I just looked at him and said, if it's wrong for my kids, it's wrong for your kids. No. I didn't say anything more. I, the expectations of behavior that sometimes we can maybe resist those a little bit. Um, but we all have them, don't we? Uh, we all have those expectations of behavior. Uh, when we go to work, there is expectations of a dress code. Some of you maybe wore a uniform when you went to work. You had to dress a certain way. You had to have, you know, the, the slacks, the dark, or the light pants, dark shirt, you know, something like that, that, that identified you that this is where you work, that this is kind of a little bit who you are. There was those expectations, expectations of behavior, that in certain settings you don't use certain language. Um, in certain places, you don't, I mean, there's just those expectations that you don't, you, things you can't do and things that you are expected to do. And um, we just have those. We live with those. Those are a normal part of our life that we accept in almost every facet of our life, that there are expectations of behavior when we are in certain places. And um, it, it's not playing favorites. It's not playing making anybody special or singling anyone out. Everybody has the same. Um, and it comes that way, it's that way when it comes to our walk with Jesus too. We've been walking through this whole First Peter section. We've been looking at these five adjectives that Peter lists here. And a few of you have pointed out that, well, you look at the text and, you know, in English, these aren't adjectives. They're verbs or they're some other uh, thing. And I'm like, well, in the Greek, they're adjectives. So you just have to trust me on that, that there are adjectives in the original language describing um, who we're supposed to be in, in our behavior. So we have these adjectives, and then Peter ends this, next, ends this section uh, talking about uh, some other behavior and other expectations that we have as followers of Christ. That it's not pointing anybody out and saying, well, um, well, you're a Jew, you can act this way. You're a Roman, you can act this way. You're, a, you're an Assyrian, you can act this way. He lumps everybody together and he says, if you are a follower of Jesus, these are the expectations of your behavior. These are the expectations of your life. Now, there is the personalities that can shine through and the personalities that can come through in our life that how we live that can be a little bit different. God has gifted us, right? God has given us our personalities. God has given us our strengths. He's given us our weaknesses. So we can live this out kind of in our own unique way, in our own unique setting. But there is something that is universal about being a 
follower of Jesus set our expectations of our life and of our behavior that if we say we are a follower of Jesus, if we say we are a Christian, if we name the name of Jesus, if we say we've been forgiven, if we say we've received him as our Savior, there are expectations that come with that that doesn't matter who you are. That we can't say, well, I live over here, I can't do this. I live over here, I have to live a certain way, or you have to live a certain way, and we, we can point fingers at each other. Like, no, this is a blanket statement that Peter is saying, this is the expectation of your life. This is the expectation if you're going to say that you're a Christian of how you live. Let's take a look at this. Let's lead, read this same section one more time. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to read verses 8 through 12. Hopefully it is very familiar to you at this point. Here we go, 1 Peter chapter 3, 8 through 12. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. This is what God has called you to do, and He will bless you for it. For the Scriptures say, If you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and His ears are open to to their prayers, but the Lord turns His face against those who do evil. When you look through this whole section, you've got to remember this section, even, even the whole letter of Peter. Peter is writing to people who are, who are Christians. He's writing to the church that's been dispersed. It's a general letter. It's not sent to any one specific person or group. It's sent to this region, to this area. It was intended to be copied and distributed to the local churches, to the house churches. And so he's writing to them, all of them, about behavior and these expectations. And so we get to this section, and he's continuing on about a personal relationship. If you go back up in in chapter 3, you look back in chapter 2 and in chapter 1, he has these statements to wives, to husbands, to to just general behavior of how we're supposed to live. And, and, And what is typical for human nature, right, is when we hear something, we want to deflect it. To somebody else. When we get to this section about wives, as husbands, we like to point out, say, hey, listen, lady. You're not quite measuring up to the standard that Peter sets here for you. You know, you need to step up your game. Now we talk about husbands. Oh, okay, I mean, I'm, don't, I'm good. You know, I'm, I'm okay. No, wives, we like to point out, hey, hey, jerk. You know, step up your game a little bit. You're supposed to treat me better. You know, we like to point out, kids, kids, listen to this. You know, this is how you're supposed to behave, children. Oh, but when it comes to dads, don't exasperate your children and don't frustrate your kids. Oh, I would never do that. And Joel said, <laughs> amen. I never frustrate and exasperate my children. I've never done that. You see how we like to do that? We get an evaluation at work. What do we like to do? We like to say, well, I'm better than the person sitting in the cubicle next to me, or I produce more parts than the guy in the table next to me. And, and we, we like to deflect the blame, like to deflect the responsibility, and we start to compare ourselves to other people. We can do that as husband and wife, like, well, thankful I'm better than them. Like, I'm thankful that I'm not married to her. I'm like, huh. you know, we, can, we can be that way. We can deflect it. What Peter is intending here is for this to be a mirror. Not to be deflected, but to be reflective. For us to read this and say, okay, how how am I in my relationship with Jesus? I'm calling myself a Christian. I'm calling myself a follower of Jesus. Is my behavior lining up? As a Christian husband, as I read this, is this my behavior? Is this my pattern? Is this my goal? Is this my aim? Is this... Is this my standard? And again, it's not saying, well, if you're, if you're Irish, you can live this way. If you're German, you can do this. You say, no. If you're a Christian, this is your behavior. And so this is intended to be reflective. We want to read the Bible oftentimes and point to someone else. 
Peter is saying, church, this is to be you. How are you measuring up to this? This is supposed to be descriptive of your life and your behavior. You can't look at anyone else. This is the standard. We're all the same. How are you doing? So as we've read through these five adjective church, how are you doing? Are you thinking of the person sitting next to you? Or are you thinking of the person sitting a couple sections over? Or are you thinking of that person that you haven't maybe necessarily been getting along with? Are you thinking of the person who said something to you? It's not what this is supposed to be about. This is supposed to be about us. This is supposed to be about me, about you. It's reflective. So as we look through this and we see, and, and okay, this is reflective. It says, don't repay evil for evil. Eye for an eye. We like to be tooth for a tooth. Do unto others before they do unto you. Some of, yeah, some of you will get that. Do unto, we, that's what it says. Evil literally means bad nature. Don't repay one bad nature for another. The way you think, believe, act. Don't repay one bad nature for another. Be above that. Be different than that. Be better. We, we live to a different standard. I love this. When, he looks, when you look down through here and he gets to um, verse end of verse 9, and it says, this is what God has called you to do, and he'll bless you for it. This is what God has called you to do. Called literally means named. The Greek word literally is named. This is what God has named you to do. Now, you go back through most of history, right? You go back to the Old Testament, New Testament, even most of modern history, most, or most of the modern world today, names carry something very significant. I think in, in America and a lot of the West, you know, you know I, well, I like the name Michael. I like the name Joel. I like the name whatever, fill in your name. Most of them really don't mean a whole lot, just something we like. Maybe it's a family name but it doesn't necessarily carry a lot of significance where most of history and most of the world, names really mean something. You go all the way back to the garden. Adam and Eve, the name meant something. Abraham meant something. God changed Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham because it meant something. Sarai to Sarah, it meant something. Joel, could you get me a glass of water, please? I'm getting a tickle. Sorry, thank you. <clears throat> Peter is writing here, this is what you are named to do. We carry that name of Christ, right? We carry the name of Jesus, and this is the behavior, the expectation of our life, that this is what we are named to do. This is our job. This is our life. This is our focus, that we no longer, well, I am a welder, or I am a GM employee, or I, not many people can say that right now, or, or I am, uh, I am a, a pastor, or I, thank you very much, um, that we tend to identify ourselves by something we do, not who we are, right? If I ask you, tell me about yourself, what do we usually start with? We start with maybe I'm a, I'm a husband, um, maybe I'm, you know, I'm a father, uh, I pastor, um, I like to garden, I like to work in the yard, I like these things. That We start with that kind of a thing. That's not what Peter's getting at here. Peter, this is what you have been named to do. This is your identity. This is your calling in life. This is it. This is the standard. What are we supposed to do in life? Who are we supposed to be in life? Peter's laying it out. Here you go. This is it. Do these five things. Don't repay. Don't retaliate. And I like to tell people, and I think it's true, that Christianity, follow, being a follower of Jesus, isn't about a list of do's and don'ts. It's about a relationship. That we have a relationship with our Father. And this is familial friendship relationship. That's true, but there are a lot of do's and don'ts. There are a lot of do's and don'ts to a relationship, right? I mean, in a relationship, you don't hit each other. That's just expected. That's common. There are a lot of do's and don'ts in a relationship. 
you do communicate with, uh, you're supposed to, communicate with one another. Well, I, I'm, I'm not coming right home from work. I've got to run to the store. Uh, I've got to go get my hair cut. And then i got to, well, some of you get your hair cut. But you got, you got these things that you have to do. You communicate. Those are do's. It's just something that is natural because you love one another and it's a relationship. Peter's starting to list a bunch of do's and don'ts here. Don't retaliate. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't do those things. It, it shouldn't be something that is hard, but it is still a standard and an expectation of our behavior. That just because you offended me doesn't mean that I get to offend you. Now, the, the do unto others as they would ha- as they would or as you would do unto them, whatever that, you know the thing. So, well, if you lied to me, I guess it's okay if I lie to you. No. Peter's saying that's not right. There are do's and don'ts in here. He goes, don't be, keep, turn, search. All of these things that Peter is imploring us. Do you remember the strong language that these adjectives are? They're, they're strong. There's a, there's a guttural. One literally means from the bowels, right? Remember that one? Be tenderhearted. There is strong language that Peter is using here of search and be and do and that is work, that is effort, that is hard. And yeah, communicating can be difficult in a, in a relationship. Um, but Peter's saying this is the expectation. This is the expectation. The, and if you do these, then God will do this. You see, at the end of this, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ear listens to them. To those who do right, if you're not doing right, it says He turns His face from you. So there are do's and don'ts that Peter lists here about the expectations of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be a part of this body, this family, of how we're supposed to act with one another. The linguistic pattern of this section, Peter is indicating that it's here and now today. He's not talking about future and the rewards that we get in the future. He's talking about now. So often we as Christians, I think we think too much about heaven. Now, I know that may seem a little like bad theology because I'm not sure you can think too much about heaven. But sometimes we think, well, I can't, I will never get my reward until heaven. You know, I, I'll never, you know, get to hear, God won't really pay attention, we won't really get the blessing. We, you know, that's all about heaven. What Peter is talking about here is here and now. Peter is quoting Psalm 34. Uh, if you have your notes, it says right in there, Psalm 34, 12 through 16, that, that Peter is quoting. And then Psalm 34, David is on the run. David is being pursued and he's being persecuted. And David writes this psalm, this section that we just read here, the quote uh, from the end of, of verse 10 through uh, 12, that David is writing this about a difficult period of his life when he's being pursued and he's being per- persecuted. And he's writing about the rewards that he receives now. It's not future, it's now. If you want to enjoy happy, uh, a long life and see many happy days today, he's talking about. Keep your tongue from speaking evil. Keep your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Pete, Paul, Peter, Paul, David, I mean David. David is writing, Peter is quoting. David's writing this from a point and from a period of life, of struggle, of hardship, of persecution. That it's easy to repay evil for evil. It's easy to do the, the, you know, what you've done to me, I'm going to do to you. It's easy for him to do that. But what David writes and what Peter is imploring us to do is, hey, don't, don't live this way. There is a reward here and now today if you live the way of Jesus. If you follow the Jesus way, it's for here and now. It's not just something that you have to wait to experience in heaven. It's now. So, do you experience evil in your life? Don't repay evil for evil. Do people tell lies about you? Don't tell lies about them. Turn away from evil and do good. Turn away from that bad behavior. 
and do good. Search for peace. Work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right and do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. David's writing this from struggle. You may be going through struggle. That doesn't give us an excuse to not live up to these expectations. We want the rewards, we want the benefits that Jesus has, has to offer. And he promises us, we, we, we love to make the claims and the promises. Well, well, Jesus promised a long life. Jesus promised deliverance. Jesus promises, the Bible promises these things. We like to quote them, but often enough we're not living this way where we're living these five adjectives, where we're being different than the world around us, that we're acting different than they are. We get in a time of persecution or we feel like we're being pursued and life doesn't go always the way that we want it to. And what do we do? We start to blame. We start to point fingers. We start to deflect. We start to say, God, I deserve what God I want. God, you promise. And sometimes I think the Holy Spirit needs to speak to us and say, well, are you living this way? Because there is a condition to my promise. There is a condition to my favor. There's a condition to you getting my ear. We do that with kids, don't we? Kids screaming and hollering. I want this. I want that. And we're trying to get their attention. We're trying to talk to them. Your behavior, when they're just screaming, what do we do? We just kind of stand back. And like, when you stop talking, you know, I'll have something for you. When you stop acting this way, I'll get you what you need or I'll get you what you've asked for. But until your behavior changes, you're not getting what you need, right? We do that with kids all the time. It happens at work. As a a boss, you you don't reward bad behavior. As an employee, you don't get rewarded for bad behavior. You don't get rewarded for not meeting expectations, right? We accept that in every aspect of life, but sometimes, for some reason, somehow, when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, sometimes we expect something different. Well, God, I can kind of behave how I want, and I can kind of say what I want, and I can kind of do what I want, and I can be a jerk, and I can say, well, they deserve it because, you know, they're a jerk, so I can be a jerk back, and I wouldn't be a jerk if they weren't a jerk. I'm not a jerk. They're a jerk. I'm just, I was like, no, expectations. You're not acting. You're not behaving the way that you're supposed to. You're not behaving the way that reflects who I am as God. And if you want my favor, if you want my ear, if you want, if you want that, here are the expectations and the requirements of being my follower, of being my child. When we meet these expectations, then we get the rewards. Because it, well, that's not fair. Why isn't it? Again, it's fair in every other part of life. It's fair in our relationship with Jesus, too. Expectations. He is laying it out plainly for us. Laying it out plainly in our life of our behavior and how we're supposed to live as followers of Jesus. I think this is one of the more practical sections of the Bible where Peter says, hey, this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. This is the behavior you're supposed to have. You know, as I've gone through this, as, as I've studied and read and tried to come up with ways to communicate it to you and with you, um, it's been pretty convicting. Because I realize that I don't always meet all of these expectations. I, I don't know that these adjectives would describe my life. I want them to. But man, it's, it's easy to repay evil with evil, isn't it? Remember, evil is bad behavior, bad... You know, it's it's easy to do that. I told you many stories about doing that. About round up in my property line because because of my neighbor. Had a friend of mine that they had a a fence between their two driveways. So there's a driveway running between, or a fence running between the two driveways. And the neighbors kind of irritated each other and they spent time throwing the snow over the fence onto the other person's driveway. Just, just to be irritating, just to, just to get on their nerves. 
I mean, how many of us do that at work? We maybe play I mean, practical jokes. That's, that's different. Practical jokes are fun. Um, scaring Chris is fun. That's not being mean. That's just fun. I'm not sure how she feels about that. But, um, but we, you know, we, we do things to needle people. Man, as spouses, sometimes we do that. Oh, I know this irritates them, so I'm just going to leave my cup sitting on the counter. Oh, we've never done that. I know this irritates her, so I'm going to turn the toilet paper over. And we do things just to aggravate, just to frustrate people. Because we're frustrated and we want, maybe we feel a little bit better. And Peter, Peter is saying, this is not the expectation of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. How are we doing, church? The thing about living this way is we often will be misunderstood. We will often be appeared as being weak because this is counter to everything that is in culture today and, and has been forever. It's, it's survival of the fittest. It's, it's get yours. Climb the ladder. Climb over whoever you have to climb over to get to the top, to achieve, to get what you want, to get what you deserve. And it doesn't matter who we hurt on the way up. It doesn't matter, you know, I, I deserve it. I, I can take this pad of paper from the office because, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't get this other thing, so I, I, I'm entitled to this. I mean, come on. Let's, we've done things like that, haven't we? Am I the only one? Yeah, pretty good. But Peter is saying, church, there's a better and a, there's a different way. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and you can't point to anybody else. You can't say, well, you... You can't go to your kids. You can't go to your spouse. You can't go to your boss and say, you, you know, this is reflective of us. How are you doing? Are you living this way? You can't worry about anybody else. How are you, you can't control anybody else. This is about you. And you will be misunderstood. And you may be taken advantage of. You may appear weak because you're not giving evil for evil. It may happen. But in the end, it's about... The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. And His ears are open to their prayers. If you want the ear of God, if you want, the, if you want God to see you, this is how you need to live. Search for it. Work for it. It's not easy, but it's worth it. How are you doing, church? Are you living this way? What do you need to change? What do you need to work at? You need to hold the mirror up to your life. You need to look through this again. Make this a part of your devotions or study or reading and say, go back to it and reference it and read. Okay, am, am I tender hearted? Am I loving? Am I of one mind? We're going to close with a song and we're going we're gonna to move on to some other things in the next few weeks. And believe it or not, before too long, we're going to start uh, Christmas stuff. I know, right? I know. Um, it, but church... If we want to change our life, if we want to change our church, if we want to change our community, if we want to change our world, this is the expectation, the behavior, and how we need to live. And we need to start here. We need to start here. I'm not saying you have to like everybody. Um, Jesus doesn't say you have to like everybody. But here's the expectation of behavior of how we treat everybody. You may have to... Like people, but you can still be of one mind. You can still be tender-hearted. You can still love them. You can still sympathize with them. This is the behavior of the church. Um, as always, the rocks are up here. If you'd like to come and take a rock, just as a remind you of First Peter 3 eight and your behavior, uh, the adjectives that should describe your life, what you're striving for. Um, maybe you want to take a rock and... Um, Stick it in your pocket, stick it in your dresser, and you may have a half a dozen rocks on your dresser or on the back of your, on your nightstand, on the back of your sink or something like that. As you shave, you can look at those rocks, and, and they can be reminded of, of what they represent, of a call to live a different life. That's what Peter is writing here. He's writing to the church that was surrounded by the Roman Empire. It was antagonistic and killing Christians. 
And Peter said, this is the behavior that you have to live with. And these are the expectations, and you don't repay evil for evil. And we can't use the excuse of our culture and our society because where Peter was writing was worse than what we live today. None of us are facing death. And he was telling them who are facing death, don't repay evil for evil. So let's stand and let's sing and let's just do as, as we sing, do some self-reflection, do some self-evaluation. If you want to grab a rock, come up and grab a rock to remind yourself uh, of the, adge- the five adjectives of a Christian life. Let's close with this song. Amen.